Good afternoon, good afternoon, and welcome to the You Are College Bound show. For all those here, you are college bound. And I already see a few people checking in. Glad you are here. My name is Brady Ferguson, and I am Senior Academic Advisor with our pre-college programs of the David T. Kern Center of the University of Rochester, and that includes Upward Bound and Talent Search. I appreciate all of you being here and tuned in to our show today. We have a great lineup of topics today. We will be discussing systemic racism. We will be discussing the SAT and SAT subject tests, along with some other news that could be important to you, that is important for all of us. So we'll, we have a full hour full of lots of good content for you today. So we're glad you're here. Now, to get your attendance credit for being here today, make sure to drop your name in the chat, full name, please, so we know who it is, so that we can give you your attendance credit and you can get those 15 big college-bound points for attending today. All you have to do is drop your name in the chat and you get 15 college-bound points. Of course, there are a couple other options. You can email your name. You can text it. The number for that is 585-301-4488, and the email address is upwardbound at ur.rochester.edu. So three easy ways to get your 15 college-bound points today. That's all you got to do. So let's see who's already checked in. The Mac checking in. Mel is here. Welcome, Mel. The Don is in tune. Okay, welcome, Jaquan. Mina is here. Hi, Amina. Glad you're joining us today. Welcome. And she says hello to her lovely Chirin. I think that's how you say that. Uh, excuse me if I mispronounced that. But once again, take a look at the screen, and that's how you get your 15 college bound points for attending today. Very easy. We, of course, encourage you to participate on social media as well. If you look up here, we have the, the hashtag, URTrioWorks. Feel free to post about the show on Instagram, on Facebook, Twitter, whatever you use. And if we see any particularly good posts, we'll share them later in the show. But just make sure to hashtag them, URTrioWorks, so we can find them easily. Shepman is here. Welcome, Shep, man. Glad to see you tuned in. Hope you're doing well. And Amin, I see your comment here that it's your second show, but last time you've been, you've been you're busy. So we understand that with the schoolwork. We appreciate you are taking care of the schoolwork, and we're glad you're here today. Now, if you did miss any previous episodes, you can go back, and they are saved on our YouTube channel. So make sure you subscribe, and you can check out any of the ten or well, the nine episodes. We've had this season of the UR College Bound Show. Today is episode 10. Oh, Daniel said, I got it right. Thank you. I guess that means I pronounced that right. Good. So you learn something new every day, right? Now, our virtual programming continues, as you probably know. The UR College Bound Show is a big part of our virtual program virtual programming, but some of it is wrapping up as far as what we are doing in the spring since April. The UR Success Academy has already finished for this spring, and our individual advising, for the most part, is wrapped up for the spring. We will be moving to a different advising model for the summer, which I'll tell you about shortly. We do have our Level Up programming or our Level Up challenges on Instagram finishing this week. Although look out for more of those coming in the summer or something similar, but maybe different too. Now our clubs are still going. We do have Coding Club tomorrow, a live session from 2 to 3 p.m. tomorrow. So check your Remind message to get the Zoom link for that. We'll send it out. And later in the show, I actually have a video of a student-designed video game that he made through our Coding Club. So I'm going to show that later in the show. So make sure you stay tuned for that. And our art club and book club are continuing as well. They will meet next week. That's just for the students who are already signed up for that. Now, if you're not signed up but are interested in art club or book club, we will have a new round of clubs for the summer. So you'll, you'll still get your chance. We tallied up the points 
the College Bound points for the month of May, and there were students who earned lots of points through doing the clubs, for doing the UR College Bound show, for other other ways, just participating in any way, doing a weekly advising meeting with your academic advisor earns you points. So a lot of different ways to earn points, and I want to show you the standings for the month of May. Here they are. So you can take a look at our standings for the month of May for UR College Bound points. And at the top of each column, you'll see the winners, our top points earners, and they have earned themselves a nice little incentive for the hard work they put in during the month of May. They'll have the choice of either a Grubhub treat delivered right to their house, something tasty, or they can get the Finders Seekers STEM kit, or they can get a video game console and students can actually use those for playing the video games that they design in Coding Club. So that's pretty cool, right? But if you take a look for ninth grade, we had Sharon Matthews going back to back. Nice job, Sharon. For 10th grade, we have Shamil Rodriguez. Good work, Shamil. For 11th grade, we have Ogazan Ozer. Ogie, I don't know if you're tuned in right now, but congratulations. Nice job. And we have a tie for 12th grade, and that's between Karee Scott and Cody Siricamfone. So nice job to all of you, and for all of our students who showed up here in the standings, nice job. Keep it up earning those points, because it's not there aren't just incentives for the top person in each grade level, but we have incentives available for all of you as long as you're earning points. The first one coming up is going to be our new edition of the Upward Bound T-shirt. We just sent it to print soon. We picked out the colors, picked out the design, and we think it looks nice. And all you have to do is earn a total of 100 College Bound points starting in April. So Sharon, as you see, earned 100 points, earned more than 100 points in one month. But we have some other students whose total points add up to more than 100 now. And you can keep earning those points this month and through the summer. So we hope that all of you will be getting that new Upward Bound t-shirt. Jaquan has been grinding. We see you, Jaquan. Keep grinding. The total points are adding up, even though you weren't the the overall winner for the, for the month. The total points from April, May, it's all and June, it's all going to add up. It's all going to add up. So you'll get there, Jaquan. Danielle giving a nice round of applause for our top college bound points earners. Well, Mina had a question. Are you still going to give us points for our grades? We only did points for the grades for first and second marking period because when school went to, to when schools closed and went to the online learning, we didn't want to make it unfair and have people who are struggling to get internet connectivity at their homes to be at an unfair disadvantage. So we're not doing points for grades for, we did not do points for grades for third marking period. And then for fourth, it's just gonna be pass fail. So no points for grades or school attendance for third or fourth marking period. And Amina, very nice, Amina. Congratulations to the winners. Keep it up. Very nice message from Amina. Kavon with the trophy there. See, that, I guess that means you might be able to earn a trophy for earning lots of college bound points. Because if Kavon is offering it, you know, she, she's the one who can give those things out. But you got to get enough points for that. I think you got to get a pretty high number of points to earn that trophy. Last announcement I do want to mention that our summer programming will be starting soon. Actually, next week we'll, we will be starting our summer squad links. Now, as I said, we're moving from the individual advising to a group advising model. So you will be put in a group with some other students, and we will be doing our group advising through our squad links, which we will start next week. And besides just academic advising, this will be a good opportunity for us to all connect and chat and talk about what's going on. So keep an eye out. Keep an eye on those remind messages. You will find out next week when your first squad link will be. We had our summer town hall meeting just this past Tuesday on June 9th. For those that missed it, the recording is on our YouTube channel, so make sure to check that out because we did share some important information there, including how you can earn money this summer and this summer only by participating in Upward Bound. Also, make sure to check your email because we need you all to sign up for Blackboard which is kind of like a Google Classroom for college students, but we are using it this summer for our summer program. So make sure to check your email and see if you got an email from, or that talks about Blackboard 
and then make sure to sign up. Now this would be your school email account, your RCSD email, and if you did not get that email, make sure to contact us so we can get you the link so you can sign up. You'll need that this summer. And stay tuned for more information on the summer. Our official start date is June 29th, and that's coming up very soon. Now it's time to move on to the next part of our show, which is our alum interview. And we have a very special guest today. She's an alum of East High, class of 2019, and she just finished her first year at Niagara County Community College, or NCCC, or NC Cube, something like that. I'm not sure exactly what the nickname is. But she's going to talk to us about her experience there and share some other thoughts with us. So let's welcome Hannah Nakayama. <laughs> and our studio audience. And a big round of applause for Hannah. So hi, Hannah. Thank you for joining us today. And let me start by just asking, how are you and your family doing with things right now? Uh, we're doing good, actually. Great. Glad to hear that. Let's go to the college and learn a little bit more about what that's been like. First, can you tell us what you're majoring in and how you I... developed an interest in that? I am majoring in the culinary arts. And I came to love cooking through my family and through high school. So culinary arts, doing cooking, and you got to that because, or through your family and through high school. Now I know East has the culinary program there. Were you involved in the culinary program at East? And was that something that you felt like led you to or prepared you for, for doing that in college? Yes, it did lead me to, and it did prepare me a lot for my college experience because I had a little more experience than some of the people that were there. Okay. Good. Well, glad, that, glad that was helpful. My little sister, many years ago, she was in the culinary program at East, and although she did not go on to study it in college, she did have several jobs where that, that came in handy, where she was doing some cooking for, for her job, so... Good program. Now, how about the family part of it? Is that something where, like, your family members taught you how to cook from a young age? Or how did, how did your interest in cooking develop through your family? Well, my mom and dad love to cook, and I've always wanted to learn to cook from them because my dad does make a lot of interesting foods and does a lot of interesting ways of seasoning and cooking the food. Okay, so what's, what's your favorite recipe that you've learned from your dad? Or tell us one of your favorites. Mm. One of my favorites would be curry. Yeah. Okay, okay. Now I know you can't reveal the secret ingredients or anything, so I won't, I won't pry too far. But Amina did give you three big rounds of applause here. Just want to share that with you. Thank you. Hannah, can you tell us about your experience so far as a culinary student and what like what your typical day looks like while you're in classes? Oh, my typical day is usually on Tuesdays and Thursdays I have my normal classes like English, math, and whatnot. On Monday, Wednesday, and Fridays I have my lab classes. They're six hours each. We learn how to cook different things. We learn how to prepare things. Um, so far all my classes have been good, passed all my classes, and that's just my typical week, usually. Okay. If I don't have a lab class on Wednesdays and Monday, Wednesday, Fridays, then I don't go to school. Okay, got it. Glad to hear you passed all your classes. Of course, glad to hear that. Now, you mentioned math and English. So, I'm curious, are there any other classes outside of culinary that you're taking besides math or English? And, and how do those fit into the program? Like, why do you take those? Math and English are required classes to take in our culinary for our normal classes. We take business and communications to help us communicate better with, and with people and how to send a proper email to your teachers. We also take, I haven't taken many of them yet. But, like, we can do, what was it? They, they oh, business uh, uh, experience. They let us work, they have, we have a restaurant in our uh, culinary campus, so we get to work there as experience. So what has that been like, working at the, the restaurant and 
actually making food for customers there? Well, I get to take that next semester to find out. I've been taking all my normal classes that are easier. So then I could build up to that. Then we take, yeah, yeah, that's about it. Okay, got it. Now we have a question in the chat here from one of our viewers that I'm going to share. But for all of our viewers, feel free to drop questions you have for Hannah in the chat. And then I can share them with her. But this one is from Kevon. And she says, six hours. Whoa, that's a ton of time in a lab. What do you do in lab? Um, the teachers give, our, give lectures in the beginning. So usually in the first day, it's easy because you don't do much. But we have to learn all the equipment, things we have to do, go through the packet that they give us, um, after that, when the day uh, starts again, we listen to our teacher talk. He teaches us the recipes we need to know, splits us off into groups. We cook that item, serve it, take pictures. Then we take a break. He lectures again. He or she lectures again on how what the next recipe will be doing. We cook it, serve it, break. We can do two to three recipes a day, depending on how much time we have and how long it takes to cook. So, yeah. Okay, so it sounds like you still got six hours with lots of activity there. Yes, we are. Now, how about on the, as far as the, the social side of college? How easy have you found it to make friends there? Oh, yes, I made a few friends, actually. And one of my friends actually lives close to me. Oh, okay. Now, do you live on campus, or whereabouts do you live there? I live with my cousin that lives in Lockport, so it's about 40 minutes away from the school. Oh, uh, okay. And what's the experience been like being a, a commuter uh, going to college there versus what it would be like for someone living on, in the residential hall? Well, living on campus would be easier because it's a short distance from the from the main campus to the culinary campus, but it saves money on having living in the housing, but it's easy to commute and it's very nice to commute because you get like nice farm animals and nice scenery on the way. Okay, so you got a nice scenic drive there. That sounds good. And certainly a good way to save money because the, the housing costs at colleges keep going up just about every year. So certainly a good way yeah. to, to save money. I'm looking in the chat here. Kevon has another comment for you, talking about the, the lab and working in the kitchen. She says, oh, that sounds pretty dope. Do I see a little Hell's Kitchen chopped or shop chef in your future? Maybe. I'm not quite sure yet. Let me finish out my school year. Maybe you'll find out one day. Okay. So that's a maybe. Maybe we'll see you on there. Here's one from Amina. Since Hannah is doing culinary, does the teacher give cooking shows like Chopped, Master Chef, etc., to give the students a creative and brainstorm some ideas? Sometimes and sometimes not. Usually they give us a set of things that we have to do by their rules. But there are times where they're like, let's be a little creative. Um, my Garma J class, it's always creative. So you could do something with the fruits, the foods that you get, the cold foods. So we did a little sushi platter and we made little designs on the mirror that were that we put the sushi on. Oh, nice. Okay. Here's a question from Gina. What is the coolest thing you have learned to cook this year? Um, what is the coolest thing I've learned to cook this year? everything honestly because it's just like the best experience I could get I finally got to learn how to make sushi rolls for the first time <laughs> oh nice to doing the maki sushi yes nice okay well, how about this what has been the best thing about college so far not necessarily the best thing you cook but just the best thing overall about college overall it would be making new friends Gaining new skills, honing my new, uh, the skills I already have from high school, and just enjoying my life at college. It's actually pretty fun. Nice. Well, glad you're enjoying it, having fun. Chat's still pretty active here. Liz 
says, hey, Hannah. That's from Liz Daniele. And then Gina had a follow-up about, sorry, I don't know how to pronounce these things either, but Garmage what? That sounds cool. Uh, Garmage is like, Garmage is like an appetizer class. So you make little appetizers. At one point before the COVID-19 happened, we were supposed to do our grand buffet where fans and family came to our school and we would cook a certain thing for them and serve them. Sorry that got canceled. I'm guessing the, your family and the families would have enjoyed that. Yeah, they would have. Yeah. Well, what about this? What has been the hardest thing about college so far? The what? hardest thing would be doing the online classes, the transition to online classes. Yeah, so Gina had a follow-up question about asking, how did you take your classes during COVID since you couldn't be in the kitchen lab? So how did that work? So for our last lab, it was breakfast and lunch. We had two of our teachers cook for us in front of us on a Zoom. So we would sit there and watch, ask questions. They sent us a grocery list because we have to do a practical. It's like a small test at the end of the lab. So they told us to buy these certain things, cut them up a certain way, pick uh, and present them. So I did... And they asked for like an egg and salad presentation. So you would buy the eggs, make the eggs the way they needed to be made and took pictures, made a small portfolio about it and emailed it to them. Okay. So you just gathered all, all right. the materials, did your cooking at home, took pictures and sent it to them? Yes. Okay. All right. Well, for our viewers, we only, got, have, we only have Hannah with us for maybe another minute or two. So this is your last chance if you want to drop any question in the chat for her. I have, I have another one for you, Hannah, just while waiting to see if any students have questions. But mine is, as far as getting advising in college, like who, who is your advisor there and how often do you talk to them? How satisfied are you with the advising process? Uh, so at the beginning, my advisor would be one of my chefs, but I would talk to my... I would talk to Kelsey. She would be an advisement to all the students. I'm not quite sure what she, I think she was our academic advisor. So we would go to talk to her for most of our questions. And then when we had to prepare for our next sem uh, semester in the class, for our classes, we would go talk to our academic av our advisors, my bad, our actual advisors, which would be one of the teachers that we would be working with. We would go talk to him to get our next classes. And overall, they've been very great at answering all of our questions, helping us with all of our classes, dropping, adding, moving our uh, schedules around. It's been great. Glad to hear that. Glad to hear been able to get good, helpful advising there. In the chat, we have a comment, not a question, but from Jaquan Bradley, East High for life. That's not a question. <laughs> that's, that's a statement, and that's a fact as well. But then we also have this Gina Ignati person. She's just had so many questions today. <laughs> but she says, did you have to buy all your own ingredients? Or did, like, did your financial aid help pay for that since you had to start buying the ingredients yourself at home with COVID? How did that work? So with COVID, yes, we had to buy our own ingredients. But before that, when we were in school, our school, because it's a culinary school, it had its own pantry. So the teachers... For that set day, they would set out a schedule, uh, give out a paper to the person who's in charge of the pantry, and then they would have it ordered within the week that we need it done. Uh, need it. Okay, got it. Great. Well, we have a couple more comments here. I think that's it with the questions. But Mel followed up with on God, Liz Daniele. The advising sounds com complex, is what she wanted to say there. But no more questions in the chat right now. So I think that's it. Hannah, you're off the hook. Great job. Thank okay. you for being on the show. And well, thank you for everything. inviting me. Let's, let's stay in touch. Okay, thank you. Bye, everyone. All right, bye. And a big round of applause from our live studio audience for Hannah Nakayama. So thank you, Hannah. We appreciate you coming on the show today. For those who dropped a question in the chat and were too late, I'm sorry for that. But we have a lot more Great discussion on our show today, so we have to keep moving. Next up, we actually have someone who has been pretty active in the chat, and you probably know her. It's Gina Ignati, 
our academic advisor. So I'm going to bring her on now. There she is. And a big round of applause to my live studio audience. Gina, how are you doing? I'm good. How are you? Pretty good. Sorry I did not get to your last question there. You have to follow no. up with Hannah on that one. But I, I know you have some have important to information to share with our students about a different topic besides cooking. So I'll just mm -hmm. let you go ahead and take it away. All right, great. Okay, so um, this is our last 11th grade Never mind. <laughs> this is our last show for the 11th graders for the academic year. Let's put it that way. Um, and there's a few things I want to give tips for. So staying safe this summer during the pandemic. Um, so it's been around three months of quarantine for many of us. The urge to get out and enjoy a summer is real. But what's safe? NPR reports on this as they ask the panel of infectious disease and public health experts to rate the risk of summer activities. From backyard gatherings to a day at the pool to sharing a vacation house with another household. Read the article in the video description of this video description, um, link in the, in the video description, on additional guidance on how to participate in these low to medium risk activities. Here's the rule of thumb. The more time you spend and the closer in space you are to any infected people, the higher your risk interacting with more people raises your risk and indoor places are riskier than outdoor. Dr. Emily Landon, a hospital epidemiologist and infectious disease specialist at the University of Chicago Medicine, has their own shorthand. Always choose outdoors over indoors. Always choose masking over not masking and always choose more space for fewer people over a smaller space. Um, just uh, in the slide right here just shows some list of activities which is included in that article in the description that you can click on the link and I'll read the whole thing later. Very interesting article. But of just some activities that are safe to do this summer and maybe some that are riskier. So just to point out some things that are safe to do and are lower risk this summer with obviously um, guidance that is given in the article is spending a day at a popular beach or pool um, is low risk, going to a vacation house with one other family, camping, and exercising outdoors. Um, like I said, the article includes details on how to do these activities safely. All right, so stay safe this summer, but still have fun. All right, so SAT updates. So SAT registration has officially reopened. Um, so many of you probably did not take the SAT um, yet because it was canceled. So the SAT dates are the following that are coming up. Um, August 29th, September 26th, October 3rd, November 7th with the corresponding deadlines. Um, there is a recommendation would be for you to take your first test in either August or September um, because you should have taken a test already in the spring, but because that you know got canceled, you were not able to. So uh, we would recommend you take your test, your first test early so you can get another test in in the early fall. Um, if you have not registered for the SAT before, you need to contact an upper bound advisor for a fee waiver. If you have registered for the SAT before, you should be all set and your fee waiver will already be pre-generated into your college board account. So you do not have to input a new fee waiver. It will generate that for you. Um, so what do you need to know about fee waivers? So you get two free SAT fee waivers with or without the essay. And then you get six free SAT subject tests, fee waivers, and the, the two, fee wa two free question answer service or student answer service reports. It's important to know that if you register for the SAT with a fee waiver and do not show up for the test, that fee waiver is gone. Think carefully about what test date would, would be best for you and you will feel most prepared for. If you registered for a SAT with a, free, with a fee waiver that was canceled due to COVID-19, that will not be charged against you. Make sure to register soon, though, because of public health restrictions and high demand, there is limited seating capacity for students testing in certain areas. Um, so you probably heard me say SAT subject tests. What is that? So the subject tests are college admissions exams on specific subjects. There are 20 SAT subject tests in five general subject areas, English, history, languages, mathematics, and science. 
Each subject test is an hour long. They are all multiple choice and scored on a 200 to 800 scale. So should you take the subject test? Well, here's some reasons why you might want to. Some colleges do require it, um, especially with certain programs. So when you're looking for colleges, definitely pay attention to whether or not subject test is a requirement. Um, subject tests are also good because they can showcase your strengths. Um, this is recommended for students who are English second language uh, students, international students, bilingual or multilingual students, and homeschool students. Um, oops. Sorry. Um, and homeschool students show it also shows your college interest. If you have a really strong interest in a certain subject area, such as history, and you've done extra time in that area, you can showcase it that way. And it'll also potentially fulfill requirements or get credit at a certain college. So some colleges might use a subject test to help place you in certain classes. In the description of this video are links to more information about SAT subject tests, including subject test dates and deadlines, as well as a list of different subjects that are offered in schools and programs that may require or highly recommend the subject test. Um, the assignment for this week is to register for the SAT by next Friday, June 19th, and to email your SAT ticket to your upper bound advisor. Um, if you need help with getting a fee waiver, please contact us. If you need help with registering, please contact us. Um, and that's it for SAT stuff. Great. Thank you, Gina. So there's there are your SAT tips for the day, your assignment for this week. And Gina, we appreciate that. Kevon actually put a comment in here, although I think this was about that first list related to the summer and staying safe, but she said, thanks for sharing, Gina. I was looking for a list just like this. So she appreciated that one. And we all appreciate you coming on the show today. And we'll see you again a little bit later. So thank you, Gina. Big round of applause to our studio audience for Gina. Next up, we have another one of our staff members. I'll bring her on right now. She is an alumni ambassador, and she does a lot of good work for our staff in all kinds of different areas, but one way is connecting with our alumni, although today she's on our show to talk about something else, so I'll bring her on. She is an alum of Vanguard Collegiate High School and also an alum of St. John Fisher College, and it's Shaquita Williams. So Shaquita, welcome to the show. Hi. Big round of applause to my live studio audience here. How are you doing today? I'm good. How are you? I'm doing well. Thank you. So if you want to just introduce the topic you're discussing today and then we can show and then we can show that video after that. Okay. So today I will be talking about systemic racism and Juneteenth. This is Jamal. Jamal is a boy who lives in a poor neighborhood. He has a friend named Kevin who lives in a wealthy neighborhood. All of Jamal's neighbors are African American, and all of Kevin's neighbors are white. Because Jamal's school district is mostly funded by property taxes, his school is not very well funded. His classrooms are overcrowded, his teachers are underpaid, and he doesn't have access to high quality tutors or extracurricular activities. Kevin's school district is also funded by property taxes, so his school is very well funded. His classrooms are never crowded, his teachers are very well paid, and he has access to high quality tutors and lots of extracurricular activities. Kevin and Jamal live only a few streets away from each other. So how come they're growing up in such different worlds with such different opportunities for success? The answer has to do with America's history of systemic racism. To understand it better, let's look at what life was like for Kevin and Jamal's grandparents. Decades after the Civil War, many government agencies started to draw maps dividing cities into sections that were either desirable or undesirable for investment. This practice was called redlining, and it usually blocked off entire black neighborhoods from access to private and public investment. Banks and insurance companies used these maps for decades to deny black people loans and other services based purely on race. Historically speaking, owning a home and getting a college education is the easiest way for an American family to build wealth. But when Jamal's grandparents wanted to buy a house, the banks refused because they lived in a neighborhood that was redlined. 
So Jamal's grandparents were not able to buy a home, and because colleges could prevent them from attending through legal segregation, their options for higher education were really scarce. Kevin's grandparents, on the other hand, got a low-interest loan to buy their first house and got accepted into a handful of top universities, which traditionally only accepted white students. This opened up a wealth of opportunities that they were able to pass on to their kids and grandkids. Even as late as the 1980s, an investigation into the Atlanta real estate market showed that banks were more willing to lend to low-income white families than to middle or upper-income African-American families. As a result, today, for every $100 of wealth held by a white family, black families have $5.04. A 2017 study confirms that redlining is still affecting home values in major cities like Chicago today. This explains how Kevin and Jamal inherited vastly different circumstances. Unfortunately, the story doesn't end there. A big part of systemic racism is implicit bias. These are prejudices in society that people are not aware that they have. Let's go back to Kevin and Jamal. Against all odds, Jamal manages to be the only student from his high school to get accepted into a great university. The same one that Kevin and his high school friends are attending. But after Kevin and Jamal both graduate, Jamal notices that his resume isn't drawing as much interest as Kevin's, even though they graduated from the same program with the exact same GPA. Unfortunately for Jamal, studies show that resumes with white-sounding names get twice as many callbacks as identical resumes with black-sounding names. Implicit bias is one of the reasons why the black unemployment rate is twice the rate of white unemployment, even among college graduates today. You can see evidence of systemic racism in every area of life. The disparities in family wealth, incarceration rates, political representation, and education are all examples of systemic racism. Unfortunately, the biggest challenge with systemic racism is that there's no single person or entity responsible for it, which makes it very hard to solve. So what can you do? The first thing you can do is work towards becoming more aware of your own implicit biases. What are some prejudices that you might hold that you're not aware of? Second, let's acknowledge that the consequences of slavery and Jim Crow laws are still affecting access to opportunity today. As a result, we should support systemic changes that create more equal opportunities for everyone. Increasing public school funding and making it independent from property taxes would be a great start so that poor and wealthy districts can receive equal access to resources. Systemic problems require systemic solutions. Luckily, we're all part of the system, which means that we all have a role to play in making it better. Peace. Okay. Systemic racism dates back to slavery in America. Since then, Black people have been purposefully put into certain situations that puts us at a disadvantage. We are routinely criminalized, but that's not who we are. I want to talk about this because of everything that's going on with the Black Lives Matter movement and being Black, I understand all the feelings, all the pain, all the anger. And I also understand that these feelings are often not talked about in the average Black household. Because we go through this so often, we are forced to push our feelings to the side. And I want to address this here because I feel like pushing our feelings to the side is something that should not be done. And we need to take all of these feelings and channel this energy into something positive. The Black community has the right to be angry. There's no reason we should have to learn to be okay with our people being killed in the streets. As you may know, there's been many peaceful protests throughout the nation. These protests have been coupled with riots and looting. Nobody is wrong for being angry and wanting to express this anger. The problem is how it's being expressed and how that reflects on the black community. What the black community needs to learn to do is to deal with our stress and anger in more healthy ways. Here are a number of different ways that you can cope with your feelings and uh, be sure to make level-headed decisions. In light of the pandemic, it may not be the safest idea for students to take part in protests that are going on, but we should all be working to do our part to support and uplift one another during this movement, even if you don't identify as Black. There are a number of things that you can do to play your part and show support during this time. 
while also being safe. You can keep yourself informed by joining the Black Lives Matter movement on their website. You can sign petitions to bring awareness to issues around systemic racism and police brutality on the change.org website. There's also a number of virtual protests you will be able to join from the comfort of your home. You should keep eye out for those. Uh, there should be. Yeah, so Juneteenth is is um it's Black Independence Day is also known as Freedom Day. It's the day that Black people in America were actually freed from being slaves. So I know that the Fourth of July is America's Independence Day, but Juneteenth is African America's Independence Day. Hey. My name is Jeremiah, and right now, I want to teach you a few fun facts about the celebration of an African-American holiday called Juneteenth. Starting off, when you look at the history of the United States of America, it wasn't always pretty. That's because people in the United States used to use slaves as labor to build things. But that is where the celebration of Juneteenth comes into play because it celebrates the end of slavery with the Emancipation Proclamation being signed by President Abraham Lincoln on January 1st in 1863. What this did was it required those states that seceded from the Union, meaning leaving the Union during the Civil War, who held slaves to no longer hold their slaves. Now, even though Abraham Lincoln had signed the Emancipation Proclamation, there weren't a lot of Union soldiers there to enforce the law, and it took a long time for the last of the slaves to hear the news. Eventually, the news got there, and that is why back on June 19th in 1865, the Union soldiers, led by Major General Gordon Granger, landed at Galveston, Texas, where the news hit that they had been freed. After hearing the news, Juneteenth began to be celebrated in many different ways, from rodeos to fishing, barbecuing, baseball, dancing, music, and more. Another crazy thing about slavery back in the day was they didn't allow slaves to dress up and wear nice clothes. So when the news of Juneteenth hit and they began to celebrate, it was always a big thing to go out and be your best dressed on Juneteenth holidays. Now you heard me mention the word holiday and actually in Texas, Juneteenth became an official state holiday through the efforts of a man named Al Edwards, an African-American state legislator. Another interesting fact about Juneteenth is it is said that in Texas, when General Granger arrived, Texas still had over 250,000 slaves who had not heard the news that they had been freed. So I guarantee when they heard, it was a big party that day. Well, that is all from me here on Welcome to Fresburg with this Juneteenth cartoon. This world is one great battlefield with forces all array. If in my heart I do not yield, I'll overcome someday. I'll overcome someday. I'll overcome someday. If in my heart I do not yield, I'll overcome someday. Like the Civil War itself, slavery didn't end with one decisive act. After the Battle of Antietam in September 1862, President Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation in January 1863, 
It declared all persons held as slaves within the rebellious states to be free. Northern abolitionists welcomed the proclamation as a first step, while Southern slave owners ignored it. Ending slavery would take a constitutional amendment passed in January 1865, Robert E. Lee's surrender at Appomattox in April 1865, the heroism of many enslaved families, and the Union Army itself to personally deliver the news to the most remote corners of the conquered Confederacy. The proclamation that Lincoln signed didn't find its way into Texas, which is where my father's family is from and the Rambo family, until mid-June of 1865. On June 19th, Union General Gordon Granger arrived in Galveston and personally delivered the news. The people of Texas are informed that, in accordance with the proclamation from the Executive of the United States, all slaves are free. This involves an absolute equality of personal rights and rights of property between former masters and slaves, and the connection heretofore existing between them becomes that between employer and hired labor. There was a, a lot of celebration, but there was also a lot of sadness, a lot of concern, a lot of fear. Both enslaved Africans and those who held slaves didn't know what really to do now. As freed Americans, where were we to go? <laughs> 150 years later, June 19th is a day of remembrance and celebration. I think my first Juneteenth celebration was when I was six or seven because I remember roasted ears of corn. And this was in Austin, Texas. And then coming here, I was surprised and really astounded to find out that Minneapolis, St. Paul have such a strong connection with Juneteenth. It stands to reason with the number of people who probably migrated from this far north who brought with them that tradition. Every year in Texas, Minnesota, and around the country, Juneteenth is marked with music, food, and fellowship. We are celebrating at Mississippi Regional Park. There's all ages here. I just see all kinds of people and colors. <laughs> it's amazing to me that, especially among uh, the African American culture, we have a little bit of a fear of, of embracing that history, you know, because there's some shame connected to slavery. I don't feel that way. I feel that that is such an important part of who I am as a person. The strength that I have within me comes from that struggle. African American yep. Independence Day. So we're celebrating yep. our day of liberation, our day of liberation. It's important to have opportunities for us to celebrate our oneness, our wholeness, our completeness, our dynamic selves. It's vital to African American people to have a an opportunity, a date, that heralds the importance of who we are as a people, what we've been through as a people. Juneteenth gives African American communities a chance to reflect on their ancestors' struggles and achievements, and also to spotlight current issues. There is a lot going on in this world. There's a lot of anger, a lot of frustration, and a lot of uneasiness. The foundation you have can kind of give you a little bit more of a sure footing because you can look and say, well, wait, my family made it through this hatred. Somehow they made it through. Yeah. So take that strength and go up to the next level. I love seeing the support that I get every year. It's always new people I'm meeting and hopefully collaborating with them so we can have Juneteenth and not let it die is so important. If in my heart I do not yield, I'll overcome someday. So we're back here, and Shaquita is going to tell us more about Juneteenth, but I want to share a few comments. First, Lark Squad, 
Jamil, I believe, is here. He says, hey. But then Amina says, I have so much interest into learning Juneteenth. So that's from Amina Shaquita. She said that. And then from Kevon, Shaquita, thank you. Never too old to learn or too young to teach. Thank you for teaching me something new today. Students, use your voice. Never know who is listening and who else may learn something new. So that's from Kevon. So Shaquita, why don't you go ahead and tell us some more about Juneteenth because this is uh, this is great for all, a great learning opportunity for all of us. Okay, uh, Juneteenth is a state holiday in 45 states, so it is not yet a national holiday. There are six more states that need to adopt it, and then it will become a national holiday. So the color red is very symbolic when celebrating Juneteenth. It comes from the hibiscus flower that was brought over from Africa during the slave trade. It also represents all of the bloodshed that was lost during slavery. And while celebrating Juneteenth, people wear red and prepare red foods. Here are some traditionally red foods that are prepared when celebrating Juneteenth. So of course, you know, they always say that black people love watermelon. And this is, um, <laughs> this is where that stems from. I mean, I, I don't know a lot of black people that love watermelon, but this is where that stems from. So they prepare like strawberry drinks, um, watermelon, of course, fruit salad, red velvet cake. Here are some other items that are on the, on the menu when celebrating Juneteenth. This includes our classic fried chicken. Black people are known for loving fried chicken. Mac and cheese and not the box kind, the, the best kind, baked mac and cheese. Cornbread which should be a little crunchy on the outside and really soft in the middle, but cooked all the way through. <laughs> and if your, if your family is Southern like mine, then fried fish is also on the menu. I thought it was important to share this information because I identify as a black woman and it's important to me. I want to encourage you all to stand up for things that are important to you, regardless of how you identify. In two weeks, the you juniors will be seniors, which means that you will be making some of the most important life decisions for you um, coming up this year. So this year, you'll be deciding where you will spend the next four years of your life. And when you are doing your research into these colleges, I need you to make sure that you feel accepted on campus, connected and respected. Do research about student groups. Make sure that these groups represent you. Uh, do research on how well your institution is connected to its surrounding community. Also, pay attention to negative press. Don't overlook these things and make sure that you make a well thought out decision about where you spend the next four years of your life for college. Well, thank you, Shaquita, for sharing all that very important information with us today and for teaching us. Thank you couple comments here. Jaquan says the baked mac and cheese be hidden. <laughs> and Amina said Juneteenth should be a law. If other people celebrate 4th of July, why not make Juneteenth a national holiday like 4th of July? Very good point, Amina. And exactly. hopefully we can get there. It sounds like we just need those five more states. So thank you for those of you, those of you for commenting. And thanks again, Shaquita. Now I'm going to bring Gina back on because I know you two had some more news to share with us, and we have a few more minutes left on the show. So before Gina and Shaquita go, they have some other news stories to share with us. So I'm going to bring Gina back on here, and I'll let you two go ahead and share the other news for today. Okay, so in other news, amusement parks will be opening back up this summer. So Disney plans to open their theme parks back up this summer on July 17th. There will be a temperature check at the gate to ensure the safety of its guests, which means that it may take longer to get into the park. And from my experience, you should wear comfortable shoes and expect a long wait. So it may be worth it to buy a fast pass if you visit. Uh, Michael Jordan's Catch-23. We all know Michael Jordan as a great basketball player and baseball player. He is now a great fisher. While participating in the 62nd annual Big Rock Blue Marlin Tournament earlier this week, his team, Catch-23, caught a 
pound blue marlin. This put his team in fifth place in the competition, and they are competing for a $3.4 million prize. Wow. That's great. <laughs> and the fast passes are really awesome. All right. So, Principal rallies his community to serve 10,000 cooked meals to seniors during 40 days of COVID crisis in India. Principal Tagore Gover Principal of Tagore Government, Arts and Science College, and Pondicherry, he has been serving hot meals to those confined in their homes during the local lockdowns, which started in March. Starting with a What's Up group, What's Up WhatsApp group of senior citizens who were unable to visit a pharmacy for medicine due to, due to closures in public transit, Dash began to deliver prescriptions to those self quarantine. For about 15 days after that, he took to bringing families packets of essential cooking supplies like rice, sugar, salt, oil, assorted vegetables. The word spread and many other organizations joined his efforts. Principal Tagore, Principal Tagore team currently provides groceries for 600 and 700 families, as well as catering for 250 people of 15, 14 to 15 different villages. On June 3rd, they entered the, for, the 40th day of food distribution and more than 10,000 meals have been served. And excuse me, it's principal of Tagore government, not principal Tagore. Um, in other news, the National Guard danced in the street with Georgia protesters. While the subject of the nationwide protests sweeping across the United States is a heavy topic, there have still been moments of levity and human connection. That was on display during protests in Atlanta Thursday night, when dancing between protesters and members of the Georgia National Guard broke out on the seventh straight night of demonstration in the city. In the moments before the 9 p.m. curfew was set to take effect, 11 Alive's Hope Ford said a woman brought out her loudspeaker and played some music. Before the end of the night, all of the crowd joined in dance to the cha-cha slide and the cupid shuffle. And that's all today for In Other News. Great. Well, thank you for sharing that other news and especially for the more positive, uplifting news. It always helps to hear that. And a big round of applause from our live studio audience for Gina and Sakita. And thank you again. Now, finally, before we close today, we have a video or a promo for our coding club. And it features a video game designed by Upward Bound student General Lindsay. So take a look here. It is Danielle here with Coding Club, here to let you know that it is never too late to join Coding Club. Right now, there are nine modules online ready for you to do whenever you have the time. And by working on these modules, you get to work towards creating your very own 8-bit computer game. One of the Coding Club members, General Lindsay, has already completed this game after just doing seven of the nine modules. General also redeemed some of his college bound points to receive a handheld console similar to this one and he can download his game to this console or any of the games that are available on the arcade make code site. So if you are interested in creating your own 8-bit video game like this one that I made which I am not very good at playing at or the one that I'm in the process of making which is recreating Meliora Impossible from one of our students back in 2012 feel free to join me this Saturday at 2 p.m. We will be sending out the link via Remind or contact your Upper Bound Advisor or call the phone number to receive the links to any of the modules. Thank you and I hope to see you this Saturday. So thank you, Danielle, and an even bigger thank you to General for making that game and letting us share it with everyone. And thank you to all of you for being here today. Remember that Coding Club is tomorrow, open to any of our students. Next week, we will be starting those squad links that I mentioned. Make sure to check your email for the message about Blackboard because you need to sign up so you can use that for our summer program. And of course, make sure to check those remind messages because we send out important information that way. A few more comments before we go here. Danielle, I see you liked Amina's comment from earlier. Kavon is just feeling hungry. Actually, I am too. I'm a vegan, but still that food is making me hungry. Vaughn says, yum now, I'm hungry. 
fish, no chicken, please. For me, vegetables, no fish or chicken, please. Shaquille, glad you tuned in today, Shaquille. Great job. Keep these coming, please. Well, we have another episode coming next week, Shaquille, and somebody told me you might be on it, but we'll see. So that's it for us today. Thank you to all of our students. I'll give you a reminder one more time about that assignment. Remember, for the juniors, register for the SAT. Email your SAT ticket to your academic advisor, 10 college-bound points for completing that assignment, and it's something you got to do anyways. Make sure to contact us if you need the fee waiver code or need any help registering. So for all of us at the Kearns, from all of us at the Kern Center, everyone have a good day, have a good weekend. Thank you for tuning in, and we'll see you next time when we have our senior celebration, which is our finale for season one of the UR College Bound show. Have a good one.